access now. It is a great honor to kick off this year first ever online version of the summit. And I have to say, a couple of months ago, I thought that there would not be a right gone. So I am in awe of the incredible resilience of this community to make it happen. You're the one who submitted sessions, who built the program, who extended invitations, and um, the appetite demonstrated to join in really reflects the importance of having this platform. Every year, we like to say that the topics and the issues discussed at RightsCon are timely and relevant. This year, there is a sense of urgency for us to address issues sometimes on um, or that we were putting away because of their complexity or because they were making us uncomfortable. The, things, the threats we're facing are very real, but at the same time, the solutions are really reach and I'm so excited for this week. I can't wait to learn from the different speakers and different contributors, whether it's in the sessions or in the forum. I am really looking forward to challenging myself and to getting out of my comfort zone and I hope you will too. So without further ado, I would like to hand over to the extraordinary Nikki Gladstone, the director of RightsCon, who together with our team pulled all of these things together. Over to you. Thanks so much, Melody. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Nikki Gladstone. I'm the director of RightsCon with Access Now, and I wanted to echo Melody in formally welcoming you to the ninth iteration of our summit series and the first to happen entirely online, which is something I didn't think I would say before this year. Um, and one of the things that I think I was most worried about when we were transitioning online, worried that I would miss the most is the, the energy of everyone from the community in one room. And, you know, I think it's really powerful to think sitting here in Toronto, knowing that everyone is connecting across different places from their own corners of the world. Um, and, you know, whether you were meant to be in Costa Rica or whether you weren't going to be able to join us in Costa Rica, it's really powerful to know that we're are all able to be here together connecting um, as a community. And I think RightsCon is going to look a, very different um, in this environment for many reasons. Um, and we thought a lot about that when deciding how to take it online. And I think anyone who's ever been to RightsCon can appreciate how complex it sounded to bring something that large, that dynamic online. And as we went through the process, I think something that we always knew was that we had to do it. It wasn't a question of would we bring it online? It was just how would we do it and how would we do it justice? Um, and many, an overwhelming majority of many of you uh, told us that it was important to you too that we did that. Uh, when we did a survey asking if that was what was wanted and needed um, and asking you if you wanted RightsCon to come online, you told us that you would take that jump with us. And so thank you for doing that and for being there, being here with us. Um, you know, in the in the current context, as the spaces that we're used to holding together are shifting and moving and adapting, in a lot of cases, they're also shrinking. Community building and connecting and these types of convenings are more important than ever. In this context, I think, and I really believe that civil society has to create its own space. And that space is here at RightsCon. It's what's been created and it's where we are welcoming an incredible 7,000 828 participants from 158 countries. And we're welcoming you all to a platform that's main purpose is to be a space for you to strategize, have conversations, and really move forward your work collectively. And with that, it is my absolute pleasure to hand it over to Brett Solomon, Executive Director of Access Now, to talk a little bit more about the issues that are at the top of the agenda and let you know who will be joining us for the opening ceremonies. Ah, I think that's a cue for me. Hi, I'm Brett Solomon. Um, I'm the Executive Director of Access Now, as Nikki just mentioned. Uh, Nikki, thank you so much um, for, well, for introducing me, but more so to you and your team for putting on this 
extraordinary event. Um, I know most of us are pretty much on mute or live streaming in one way or another, uh, but I think we could take a moment just to clap or even rise for a standing ovation for Nikki, Sarah, Daphne, Rodrigo, Mariana, Kayla, and the entire Access Now team um, for all of their work in putting this together. Um, so here I am, I can hear the roar out there. Uh, and, um, you know, when we talk about digital transformation from offline to online, I think this is what people are talking about, this rapid, immediate um, demand to move things from an offline environment to an online environment. So congratulations to the team for launching this ninth annual RightsCon, this time online. Um, our mission as an organisation, as the host of RightsCon, as Access Now, is to defend and extend the digital rights of users at risk. Um, our 75 strong team works across 20 or so locations across the world. I'm currently in Australia, which would explain why it's night time outside that door. And in a few, few moments, I'd like to uh, invite uh, Tendai Achumi, who's the UN Special Rapporteur on Racism, Racial Discrimination, Xenophobia and Related Intolerance to join the conversation. Uh, we couldn't be more pleased to have her uh, join, he, join us here and to open uh, the conference. And it's not a coincidence that she will be our first speaker. It's clear that we all uh, have a lot to do in order to achieve uh, racial justice across the world and particularly in the tech space. And as a white man, I recognise that it's important for me to, um, to be an ally, to listen intently uh, and to challenge my own prejudices and race-based assumptions and actions. And, you know, this is the beginning of, the, of a journey for many of us. And over the coming days, I really invite you to think deeply about racial injustice and justice in these discussions about colonialism and decoloniality. This is an intersectional issue that requires an intersectional response on the basis of gender, sexual orientation, disability status and class. And I'm sure that this, the special rapporteur will talk more to this. It's also particularly pertinent in Australia where I am where the Black Lives Matter movement has spread and where Australians of all different um, backgrounds are demanding justice for Indigenous Australians from prisons to tech platforms. And whilst RightsCon has delved deeply over the years into issues of inclusion and diversity and identity, it has not actively had an anti-racist agenda. Let us change that today. Um, the issue of racial justice is the first theme I therefore want to draw your attention to. The second, of course, is the issue of public health, digital rights and COVID-19. And it's related to the first matter because we know everywhere uh, in the world, racial, ethnic and national minorities are hardest hit by the pandemic. These populations are in essential services, on the front line and the least likely to be connected where disconnection can mean living in a society, living in a socially isolated desert, or if without public health information, not living at all. So many of the sessions over this week naturally therefore will focus on health, a theme that was actually nascent in last year's discussion ahead of the pandemic. Now it's the track which every session will likely follow, follow to some degree or other. From contact tracing to immunity passports to the vitality of connectivity to immunosurveillance to the future of privacy to digital identity, this is certainly the pulsing challenge for RightsCon 2020, to survive the crisis of the health pandemic, but not to exacerbate a human rights crisis in doing so. At RightsCon, we know that rights can only be achieved through participation, but the world over, as Nikki indicated, civil society participation is also being excluded. We can't necessarily protest in the streets. We are prevented from entering parliaments and congresses, as Maria Reza will tell us in a moment, as our representatives gather behind closed Zoom calls. We are watching new laws emerge from Brazil to India without consultation with experts and activists on the ground. So this is the third standout issue for me, for me political participation and the right to assembly, which is why Access Now released a report today on the impact of technology on the rights to freedom of peaceful assembly and of association worldwide. So, so RightsCon is here, um, online this time, 
assemble to create and hold our own space. And I want to convey my deep respect for the activists and social movements who are rising to meet the needs of this moment, <clears throat> which on top of all the other challenges that you're currently facing or that you already face, is really monumental. And to that, we welcome almost 2,000 corporate, government and intergovernmental colleagues to join us as equal partners in these discussions. And I encourage you to take a moment to listen intently, especially to the most marginalised. We have almost 8,000 people who will gather this week and the majority of them are from civil society. But one representative from government who I'll be pleased to uh, introduce in the opening panel uh, is the Costa Rican Minister for Science, Technology and Telecommunications, Minister Castillo. But we can only do all of this with connectivity and with the half the population online, that means half the world's population offline and so many people personally experiencing shutdowns, our work seems to be getting harder. We are working closely on intentional disruptions of the network from Ethiopia to Myanmar to Kashmir. This year has already seen 53 shutdowns in 15 countries and the Keep It On Coalition is working hard in the courts from Togo to Indonesia to prevent that where it was held in a sense that access to the internet is a right which cannot be taken away by the state. But the battle for global rights respecting connectivity has not been won, and this is the fourth theme that we must address. So to conclude, every year at RightsCon there are multiple external human rights abuses and crises which are unfolding. Last year our attention was on Sudan and on Hong Kong. This year the crisis has again intensified in Hungary where there is a press freedom emergency being broadcast in real time. The biggest news site uh, index, which is perhaps the last remaining or one of the last remaining independent news sites, um, saw its editor-in-chief fired and the subsequent resignation of the full editorial staff of about 100 people. This is particularly devastating in Europe. And to that end, we'll be joined by one of the leading press freedom advocates, Maria Reza, who was listed by Time magazine as one of the 100 most influential people of 2019. Um, as she has extensively reported in the Philippines on President Duterte's deadly crackdown, including uh, in his State of the Union address, which just happened prior to this uh, opening ceremony. And she will be our third speaker in the lineup today. And like each year, I want to draw attention to the plight of Allah Abd al Fattah, who has been detained in his home country of Egypt for almost all of the 10 years since he spoke at RightsCon in 2011. His sister wrote to me today to say that Allah, a software engineer and advocate, has now been in maximum security for 10 months straight in horrific conditions. And since, and that's the photograph of him when he spoke in 2011, and thank you for putting that up. Since the crisis of COVID started, she told me today that the Egyptian government has used it as an excuse to tighten the isolation and denial of rights of all prisoners, of which there are thousands. Her letter and her full story can be found on the Access Now website and again shows the intersectionality of all of the issues that we'll be discussing at RightsCon over this coming week across the over 300 sessions. And I think that's my roundup. So let us hear, please, from our first speaker, the UN Special Rapporteur, Tendai Achumi. Please, the floor is yours, Special Rapporteur. And thank you very much, uh, Nikki, and the entire team for including me in this amazing session. I really regret that um, we cannot all be together in person, but I'm really excited to be able to join you um, virtually. Um, as you're all aware, nationally and transnationally, an uprising triggered by the murder of George Floyd has really forced a long overdue interrogation of systemic racism, not just in the context of, of law enforcement, which itself heavily implicates um, tech, but it's forcing a conversation around systemic racism in all fields of life. And the area of tech is one where this conversation is equally um, urgent. And so I'm really pleased that this is going to be a theme that is addressed in different settings and one that's addressed 
addressed alongside other themes such as um, health and, and other human rights um, issues. I'm joining you today because uh, my last report to the Human Rights Council, which actually I just presented in July 2020, focuses on racial discrimination and racial injustice in the field of emerging digital technologies and their design um, and in their use. And even while the issues are especially salient right now, I want to highlight that I began working on this issue about 18 months ago, um, and I was motivated to do so by a number of factors. Um, on the one hand, there were definitely um, researchers and advocates who were working on racial justice issues in the field of tech. I found that those groups tended to be marginalized from the most um, salient conversations within the UN system and even within the human rights field around how we think about that intersection between tech um, and human rights. And then in conversations around tech and human rights, to the extent that racial justice and racial discrimination issues were a part of the conversation, they tended to focus very narrowly on a set of issues involving hate speech online and perhaps content moderation. Those are important issues. Um, but as we will be discussing in this opening ceremony, and I hope in some of the other sessions you will have, that's just the tip of the iceberg. And so my sense was that in the tech and human rights space, the most focused on norms that were receiving the, the greatest attention, at least within the UN framework, were privacy, um, freedom of expression, and then there were some other powerful interventions from other special rapporteurs who'd focused on socioeconomic rights, but there was a need to really grapple with what human rights norms around racial justice um, and racial equality really have to say about the tech, the tech space, how tech is designed and how it is used. And so the report that I hope we'll be able to, to go into in more detail really tries to bring some of that analysis, taking a, what I describe in the report as an intersectional and a structural approach to thinking about racial justice um, issues. So in Brett's introduction, he spoke of the importance of thinking about racial justice and racial discrimination alongside other forms of, of injustice and, and discrimination, whether it's on the basis of gender, disability status, class, and my report very much attempts to take an intersectional approach. And when I say a structural approach, I mean moving beyond just cases where we have explicit prejudice, you know, and there are many cases where you have discrimination against racially or ethnically or religiously specified group where there is an intent to harm them using um, emerging digital technologies as the case of the Uyghurs in China, I think gives a very vivid example. But there's also many other cases where there is just the disparate impact of technology actually reinforces, reproduces, and in some cases even exacerbates structural racial discrimination all over the world. Another aspect of the report is that it offers a global analysis. Sometimes conversations around racial justice and racial injustice can be skewed towards certain regions. But what the report really aims to do is to show that we have a global problem here. And it's very important that we bring global norms to bear and they're very powerful norms in, this, in, in the human rights framework that can be deployed um, more robustly than they, they have been. And so I'm, I'm hoping in part through the conversations that will be had at RightsCon, that the human rights community will act more forthrightly and take on more centrally issues to do with racial justice and racial injustice um, and, and racial discrimination in the context of emerging digital technologies, because that is one of the ground zeros of where we see some of the greatest harms. And so I'll end there, and I look very much forward to this conversation that we're going to have in this session and then to also the sessions that will follow. Thank you. Thanks very much. And I think now's an opportunity to hand over to, to Maria Reza from Rapla. She's the CEO uh, and the founder. Uh, Maria, I know you've had a very busy day uh, with the State of the Union address. Love to hear from you for a couple of minutes, then we'll hear from the minister and then we'll come into a group conversation. You know, the first one is to pick up from what Tande said is that uh, let me just call, I think the biggest shift that has impacted rights all around the world is a behavioral modification system we know as social media, but it is actually exacerbating the worst of human nature and it is a behavioral modification system, right? Uh, in, in my case, we'll talk about it in terms of 
the Philippines and uh, the battle for facts, which actually is happening all around the world. And in my, um, let me put it in the battle that we've had for the last four years, which is um, racist, right? So in 2016, President Duterte um, won the elections in May of 2016. That was really the beginning of the domino effect, right? Going all the way through the next month was Brexit. Um, in 2016, that was also the first year when we came under attack for impunity, challenging impunity on two fronts, a brutal drug war here in the country, in the Philippines, and social media, Silicon Valley, and its impact on on our information ecosystem. That was also the year after we did our propaganda war series that we were targeted first online. So the narrative, journalist equals criminal, was seeded on social media. Uh, the next year in 2017, that same narrative, right, which I kind of sloughed off because I thought, oh my gosh, by next year, I'll next year I'll be a, a journalist for 35 years and my track record should be okay. Journalist is not equals a criminal. Laugh, laugh, laugh. Well, you hear it a million times when it's pounded a million times on social media. All of a sudden, people think, mm, maybe it's not far-fetched. Have you heard this? Have you heard this? And then all of a sudden, this astroturfing bottom up in 2017 was met by top down the same message coming from President Duterte in his State of the Nation address. We just had his fifth one today. Uh, but in July 2017, he, he said the exact same thing. Uh, that then is the weaponization of social media. In 2018, that was followed by the weaponization of the law. Journalist equals criminal. I had uh, 11 cases and investigations filed against me and Rappler at that point. In 2019, eight arrest warrants issued. I was arrested twice in a five week period. And then just a, a month, not even a month ago, June 15th, uh, a colleague and I, a former colleague and I were uh, convicted for ret a retroactive conviction for a law that was, uh, was actually not in place when we published this story in 2012. So journalist equals criminal. This really shows you how it moves from the seeding on social media, the weaponization of social media, the weaponization of the law, and then a conviction. It, it, it's how we change reality. Finally, the third part I want to do it, talk to you about is how 2020 has exacerbated these conditions that have been going on for the last four years. And of course, COVID-19 um, in the Philippines, this has become, this is now our 19th week in lockdown. It is a security driven lockdown. President Duterte talked about some of the things that he had, he admitted the failures in dealing with some of these, but Here's the last part. That wasn't the only thing that happened in the Philippines. COVID then set the conditions for a consolidation of power for the Duterte administration. Uh, my conviction in June began to codify abuses of power into law. In order to convict me, the government actually, the court, I'm sorry, had to change uh, the statute of limitations for libel from one year to 12 years. That was followed soon after by the shutdown, the permanent shutdown of our largest broadcaster in the Philippines, ABS-CBN. And that is followed by the third part, which is codifying into law an anti-terror law that was passed, passed through Congress in just five days that essentially would give cabinet secretaries the power to designate a critic, a journalist, someone like me, a terrorist. And by doing that, uh, we can be picked up without an arrest warrant and uh, jailed for up to 24 days. So you can see the landscape has changed um, and the tech and technology plays a critical role in beginning this effect. Mm. This power. Mm. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much, um, Maria. I really look forward to hearing more and discussing more both uh, with the Special Rapporteur and also with the Minister about the situation that you're currently facing. I read in one report that uh, if you combine all of the, um, the charges against you and your team, it would add up to 100 years. 
um, which is uh, kind of devastating, of course, and 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 I'm sure for you personally and for your team, very stressful. Um, let's hand over to to the minister now, Minister. Thank you so much for joining us from Costa Rica. As you know, we were meant to be having RightsCon Costa Rica in your home country, and thank you very much for your support in putting that event together, and of course for joining us now. The floor is yours. Well, good morning, dear RightsCon participants. I extend warm greetings on behalf of the Republic of Costa Rica. As, as uh, you may remind, the current edition of RightsCon was, was planned to be held in our country. Although it unfortunately turned out to be impossible this time, I cherish the hope that the time will soon come in which we will be able to resume this plan. So it will be a pleasure for us to welcome you to our country. Uh, we are here to discuss about a topic that, in fact, should be self-evident. However, um, human race has been struggling with, with issues related to human rights for thousands of years, and sadly it still does. Of course, some progress has been achieved, but it is also clear that we still have a long way to go. On top of that, we have created virtuality, leading to a new parallel world that arises numerous questions that we are trying to answer and that will certainly bring many other that still remain unspoken. Looking back at how it all began, I bring you the following words of Gordon Moore, uh, referring to the microelectronics industry. These are uh, very interesting words for us since I myself, I am a uh, an engineer that um, is specialist in microelectronics. So at that time, uh, Gordon Moore said, when you, when you see the numbers or hear your company's name on the evening news, and you are once again reminded that this is not, not sorry, that this is no longer just an industry, but an economic and cultural phenomenon, a crucial force at the heart of the modern world. When we think about virtuality, now his words can be undoubtedly applied to the virtual, virtual world we are living now. This pandemic has accelerated the pace at which digitalization and virtuality is massively expanding to every aspect of our lives. But the truth is that we were not prepared for this. We are at the beginning of legal and societal discussions about virtuality. So the virtual world certainly opens an unprecedented opportunities for effective and immediate communication for the benefit of humanity. But this is exactly why we need to prevent its use as a tool for extending violence, intolerance, misinformation, and the perception of lack of safety. In 1982, in his book, Critical Path, the futurist and inventor Richard Buckminster Fuller indicated that until the year 1900, Humanity needed a century to duplicate its knowledge. At the end of the Second World War, it took 25 years, and today we need only 13 months. IBM estimated that Internet of Things would reduce the time to double the amount of information generated by human race in just, to just 12 hours. So we are living in privileged times of exponential advance of knowledge and technology, and no other time in history has witnessed the generation of this amount of new information and knowledge. But what kind of information we want to be generated? How much of this information refers to us and is obtained without consent? How to deal with freedom of expression, but also with fake news and digital violence? We have the right to be connected. And this is something that the pandemic really brought uh, as an issue. How do we ensure the right of people to be connected in order to continue with work, with their relationships, with their families, their friends in this uh, stage of isolation, but also the right to education and to obtain uh, information? And what about the gap in digital literacy? So people also have the right to be uh, to have this digital literacy at hand and to provide the means for achieving that. And we still, we're still we still trying to answer very simple things like how and when I got tracked if I never granted access to this. And I'm, I'm trying to think here as a citizen, as this uh, 
citizen that faces every day these questions. What if I was included in a WhatsApp group I didn't didn't want to be in? Shouldn't I be asked first by the app uh, if I wanted to be included before I am included? Shouldn't I have the right in every subscription service to delete my email account, especially if someone else used my account? These are very simple questions, but we're still trying to, uh, to answer them for the citizens, and we're still trying to provide the mechanisms for that. And let's imagine now about the most difficult questions that we are facing that we'll still have to solve. For example, the legal concerns in institutions and citizens about data sharing. And in, in our country and probably in many countries, uh, the pandemic revealed important legal and procedural gaps. And people is turning to our ministry to answer many of these questions. And we're specialists in technology, but that means, I mean, we need people which is specialist also in, the legal issues of technology. And those will not be, probably not all of them will be in, in our ministry. And this also arose the questions of, on how prepared we are as governments and institutions to deal with this. And if law enforcement is difficult in the non-virtual world, how are we going to cope with this in the virtual world? So there are really still many things to be solved. And I am, I am glad that uh, we have the opportunity to discuss them in this, uh, in this uh, conference. I hope that uh, all these discussions and conversations will bring really fruitful uh, policies, decisions, suggestions for people to help them deal with this new world and also to help governments and institutions make this new world a good one instead of one extending violence and intolerance and inequality. Thank you, well, um, th thank you so much, and Minister. Thank you for such an um, honest and considered um, um, perspective that you provided there because I think I'm sure that Maria and others from countries around the world don't have ministers of technology who are really thinking about the the philosophical, the political, the economic, the social, as well as the technical um, uh, matters that are at play in, in coming to some conclusions about many of the decisions that are at the front of governmental policy. Um, so, um, Tendai, if you don't mind, I'm going to flip back to you. Um, and you mentioned in your report uh, that you, actually the thematic of the report was looking at um, the, 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 the racial injustice elements of technology. I, you, you took a report as the special rapporteur on, on um, racism and racial discrimination and decided to actually focus your whole report on technology, which means that technology really has to play a very significant role or it would appear to play a significant role in um, exacerbating and compounding uh, existing inequities. And I think you identify that along a range of lines, racial, ethnic, national. Um, so you provided a series of recommendations. Let's play a small game here for a second. Imagine that we had Mark Zuckerberg on screen with us right now. Um, what is the one thing that you would ask him to do? And I don't mean you know, a human rights impact assessment of his platform. I mean, like, if you could ask him to do one thing in order to alleviate some of that exacerbation on, of racial injustice that you talk about, um, what would it be? So this is, I mean, there's so many things that come to mind, but I'm going to step away from the kind of technical impact assessment style uh, solutions and maybe say, really take ownership over what kind of um, a project he is involved in, you know, and, and this I think applies to Facebook and, and many other of the big tech companies, which are 
right now world making, right? They are creating universes in which we all live and to which we are all held captive. And the norms that underlie the worlds that they make shape the way those worlds operate. So with Facebook and many other social media platforms, they've constructed their worlds around norms of free speech, where free speech is untethered from other kinds of norms like racial justice, like you know, um, inclusion of other groups. And once the, the the fundamentals of how you organize the platform are structured around a certain type of norm at the expense of another, and you might think about um, Facebook's even, it's, its business model, right? And this is part of the big critique with these big tech co uh, corporations is that the way that they make money is compatible with and sometimes benefits from um, racial discrimination and racial ex uh, exclusion. Mm -hmm. And to me, that speaks to a failure to truly internalize exactly what kind of project he is he and the company is involved in and so my recommendation or the thing that i would ask is take ownership of the world that you are creating and understand that the norms that you have placed at the center are the ones that are going to be privileged and reproduced on that platform and racial justice yeah. and racial equality is so low on the totem pole of values that are prioritized on Facebook that it's no wonder that it's, it's doing so much harm in that space. Thank you. Um, I'm not sure if I can be heard. Can you hear me, Tendai? Yeah. yeah. Okay. I so look, hear. yeah, great. Great, great, great. Thanks. I mean, as you say, the, the complexity is great and the scope and scale of that particular platform is so large. Um, and if you de prioritize or de-emphasize the issues of racial justice or racial identity, they end up being caught up in this, I guess, this maelstrom of replication of what we've seen offline and, and also an amplification of what we've seen offline. But it's not just the tech platforms like Facebook that are important here. It's all of the, like you look at every single tech company, every single company, it's now a tech company regardless of what they sell. And I think you've also identified that in the report that it's, you know, it's 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 about um, it's about the human embedded technologies like pacemakers. It's about predictive technology of policing. It's about the skewed data sets that determine the likelihood of employment uh, or social welfare. It's now about the tracing apps. Um, so this is not just a tech platform issue. It's also a ministerial. It's a government issue. And you know, as a the special rapporteur, you report to member states. You actually have a minister here of technology on the line. Now, I don't want you to reflect upon Costa Rica's uh, tech, you know, sort of tech framework, but as a minister, as a minister of technology, and it was very interesting what she said actually about her ministry being asked for solutions that had been actually just looking at technology, but now it's across the whole spectrum. What is what is the, what would you suggest to ministers of technology um, in terms of governmental policy to? to put in place to not exacerbate some of that discrimination or racial injustice that we're seeing in the online environment. Mm -hmm. Thanks. So I would say uh, two things, and the report actually includes a number of recommendations for, for member states, and I would encourage the member states to read the reports because of detailed recommendations. But I would say two things I want to highlight here. One is, where is the law? So we have existing human rights frameworks, including around racial justice and racial inequality. There's a very robust anti-racism framework that exists at the international level and that most governments have actually signed up to. But you don't see the International Convention for the Elimination of Racial Discrimination really dealt with in tech conversations, whether it's about how governments are structuring their technological responses or how they're regulating private governments. So I would say, where, where are you using, where is the law being applied? Is it being taken seriously as a resource? And then to close the gap between general principles and concrete recommendations, because I think the minister really highlighted how you can have general principles, but what do they mean at the granular level? I would ask states, who are the experts that you're consulting? So one of the things that came up in the production of this report is how, you know, the engineers, the, the tech companies have government's ears, but the communities that are most directly impacted, especially racially, ethnically marginalized um, groups, aren't necessarily treated as experts who might provide detailed information about how the law should protect them. And I think what's happening right now when we see the uprisings on the streets is, 
people who are impacted by oppressive technology saying, here's what it would take to actually give meaning to human rights principles that exist. So it would be a call to say, where is the law and who are your experts? And can you use people who are most directly impacted as experts on how the law might better protect against some of the most frightening dimensions of what we're seeing? Mm. Thank you. And I, and I think, Maria, to bring you in here, like it's clear that you are, in a sense, one of the, the kind of victims here of, of this, maybe it's not a racial justice issue, but it's certainly a political opinion issue. Um, and, you know, you've worked tirelessly to hold the line against the administration um, and to expose the truth, as you said, to, to get fact out there, to demand the right to report. Uh, I think you even said at one point the freedom of the press is the foundation of every single right that we have as citizens. Do you have a perspective on the future of press freedom, of press freedom in the digital age? Like, where do you think this is going globally? And it also relates to the role, of course, of the platforms, which are now, in a sense, publishers. Um, you know, they're the ones that are actually often the gateway um, or the roadblock to, to that sort of information that you're trying to publish. So, you know, friend and foe, let's hear, hear from you about you, your perspective. First, can I take, it's a great question, but I'm going to tie up racial justice or injustice with the social media platforms because in the end, Thank you. these are all connected, right? Um, the, so from, from uh, the design perspective, part of the problem is that facts, the way the foundation of, of how we communicate to each other about what the world looks like is now being delivered by a system that is actually manipulative or is used in a manipulative manner. So the first one is if you look at the design of social media platforms, there's one thing they all have in common, which is built into the design is actually the ability to tear society apart. It's, and it, it's one coding decision that was made for growth of the platform. And that idea is to use, to recommend to each of us to allow growth for our networks and for the social media platforms, this idea of friends of friends, right? If you go back to like the Granovetter, this paper on the strength of weak ties, we form these clusters, but social media platforms take it a step further instead of six degrees of separation. Facebook will have 4.7 degrees of separation because they recommend friends of friends, right? The problem with recommending friends of friends is that let's just say you start here um, and we can take something like there's a film that was out in Sundance called Coded Bias, where people just can't, the, the programmers had built something where they a, a black person just couldn't see themselves in artificial intelligence, right? So let me show you an example of how this Friends of Friends works. Let's talk about here in the Philippines, pro-Duterte, anti-Duterte. If at the beginning, we all started in the center where we agreed on a set of facts, all of the pro-Duterte people would be, uh, the engine of recommendation would say, well, here, bring friends of friends in, and they will move further here. At the same time, they will see far less of the anti-Duterte opinions because they are moving further here. And then they move further as, as the platform grows because the recommendation engine builds in extremism and radicalization. And here we have a completely gutted public sphere, right? So if you think about this, it really is a governance issue because facts should not be debatable. Facts should be in protected in the public sphere. And that brings it to press freedom. Journalists are the gatekeepers to facts, or we were for a very long period of time. We no longer are. Uh, tech has taken distribution of news. The world's largest distributor of news is Facebook. And yet they've abdicated the responsibility of protecting the public sphere. So if we all no longer believe in facts, you can take this thing again and make it be left and right in the United States, right? Or how about disinformation attacks, influence operations against Americans that target Black Lives Matter? 
on both sides. This is proven in 19, in 2016 elections, right? And then you just fast forward when you don't actually stop it, when you continue to let it happen, it the, the goal of influence operations is to change the way real people think and act. And that's what we've seen mm -hmm. pounded for four years. And this is why we are where we are today. And and, and do you that think, and, and I've said, yeah, I have, it's clear I have so many follow-ups for you, but I, I've got we've got limited time. But but the, the question then, I think it relates to: um, Are we actually seeing the internet um, as a hindrance, as a direct hindrance to democracy, an enabler of autocracy? I mean, is that the experience as a result of all of this division and 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 at the same time, I mean, the internet has actually been the it's been your mouthpiece. It's enabled Rappler to communicate with you know a million out of ten million uh, citizens in a way that like you would not have been able to do, I think, through traditional traditional media. So there's this like this incredible enabler, and at the same time, it's probably going to be the cause of your detainment. Um, and 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 perhaps you're the personification of this, you know, this kind of eccentric um, 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 bipolar <laughs> experience that we're having of the internet. And, and should and should we be advocating? Like, how should we be advocating to protect that open rights respecting internet going forward? Wow, that's a ton. Of, that's a lot of. You know, right? So the first. Time Yes, absolutely. This is destroying the public sphere as it is right now. And secondly, there has to be some governance in this because self-regulation for tech platforms have not worked. This is part of the reason you look from 2017 until today, all of the research has shown that cheap armies on social media are rolling back democracy. It is playing to the worst of human nature and there is no protection for users. This is part of the problem, right? Um, what about the frontliners, the journalists, the human rights activists, uh, opposition politicians in the Philippines? So uh, number one, it has gotten worse. Number two, uh, I don't think we throw the baby out with the bathwater. And there are lots of solutions mm -hmm. that can that we can talk about, right? Uh, lots lots of books have been written. Um, uh, uh, Chris Wiley, the Cambridge Analytica whistleblower, says, "Well, why not have building codes for tech, right? Uh, individual coders are going to have to sign building codes, like building codes for buildings." But mm -hmm. the second mm -hmm. one is. There's actually a very interesting book coming out in September. Sina Naral at MIT recommends that it starts with protecting the users first, right? So data portability, social network portability, these are some of the things, because if you do that, there you give the networks, the social media platforms, incentive to protect the users. Um, right. Regulation is gonna have to be part of it. And for anyone fighting for the internet, that's a difficult thing. Who gets to decide this? I'll say the person, you know, Mark Zuckerberg will always say, you don't want us determining uh, what should be censored. But, you know, that's just a wrong understanding of what censorship is. Because in the end, mm -hmm. as it stands right now, these platforms are already censoring. They're already determining which speech gets the widest distribution? And right now, lies laced with anger and hate spread faster and further than really boring facts. Mm. Thank you. And, and you raised the issue, Maria, a number of times around governance, and, and which is the perfect segue for me to, to approach the minister, whose responsibility actually is governance within the Costa Rica um, 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 jurisdiction. And so l let me ask you, Minister, like, you know, you're an expert on nanotechnology, uh, the smallest of technologies, where we're now seeing that technology is having such a large impact. You know, what do you think about the role of government in regulating tech? It's really one of the serious, the most significant questions of our time, which is like, you know, there's been calls from Microsoft and others to, to for government to regulate facial recognition. 
should 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 governments now be taking a stronger hand in this? And 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 real quick, if you're if you're comfortable to answer this, is like should the tech companies be broken up and be, due to their oversized impact on society? Well, uh, one of the most difficult things on technology right now is that uh, we are um, we are creating technology that is bringing issues that we still do not know. And uh, it's like trying to, to look into the future and imagine what could happen. And if, if you think about microelectronics, something that started uh, in, in, in a lab with, um, let's say, a device like this size, now is, uh, or maybe like this, now it's uh, really uh, bringing us to um, unprecedented um, not only uh, computational power, but also uh, unprecedented consequences, because uh, it also, um, let's say, it also it gave a lot of impulse to telecommunications, and it, it made the world we are having now, in which a message, whether it is good or bad, is spread uh, immediately all over the world. And that is something no one could have predicted before. Or if we think about the possibilities of uh, miniaturizing devices and what could be uh, achieved in terms of uh, recognition of people and uh, tra tracking and many other things, it's uh, really difficult to imagine what will happen with technology. And that about think that only thinking about technology already existing. What about uh, the possibilities, for example, of quantum technology, uh, compu quantum computation? Um, however, I do think that uh, companies yeah. and governments yeah. should really try to uh, raise awareness on what technology might bring, even if at this moment will seem like science fiction. Yes, We mm -hmm. cannot wait until uh, the technology is bringing these effects in our lives to say, okay, now what? It will be too late. So I think uh, companies and, and, and engineers uh, and also uh, people taking decisions in this business, but also uh, if we think about advocates, if we think about um, uh, decision makers, they all sure have some awareness of technology, the new possibilities, but also on how this will reflect in society and how this could be uh, brought to, let's say, to legal security for people to really uh, mm -hmm. rules that will be able to adapt to the current technology. Thank you, Minister. I would like to, I wish we had more time, I would like to delve more deeply into this question on, on governance and who has responsibility, because there are many questions that you as a minister, and I think many ministers around the world are facing, bringing up some very difficult questions around, you know, the regulation of the tech sector, but also like how are you addressing the privacy concerns of tracing apps? How are you dealing with freedom of expression for your citizens versus the challenges of misinformation and hate speech online? These are some of these very difficult questions that the governance needs to come from the state as well as input from the tech sector and responsibility and ownership by the tech sector. And of course, hopefully guidance by civil society, many of whom are here today. With that, um, please join me in thanking our panel. Uh, I think we've opened up a number of uh, Pandora boxes for discussion over the coming five days. And over to Nikki Gladstone, who is uh, the director uh, of this uh, extraordinary event and will help us to provide us with some further information about how to successfully navigate this complex and interesting program. And before that, I just want to also th say thank you very much to our sponsors who have moved with us from RightsCon, from being an offline event to being an online event. I don't think we lost one sponsor in the transition, some from companies, some from governments, some from ministries, uh, some from foundations. Thank you very much for your support. Nikki, over to you.
Hey, Nikki, I think you might be on mute. So maybe we can get you off mute and bring you back onto the screen. Oh, hi. Can there you hear we go. me? Can we start again? We missed no, we missed yeah. all of that. Oh, Here that's too bad. Okay, to I'll do that again. I, I started off saying that I would do it really quickly, but now I'm making you watch me do it twice. So I will be quick this time. Um, so I wanted to share a few reminders about the platform and how to have your best possible experience. Um, there's a lot happening on the platform, as we've mentioned a few times. There's over 300 sessions, discussion forums, one-on-one -on -one chats. Um, the Guide to Rights Con on the platform should be really your first visit. We've put um, a lot of information there for you to know how to set up your profile and time zone, how to understand the program and really build an agenda. And just on the note of the agenda, um, I wanted to say a big thank you to all of the session organizers who came on this journey with us and did an incredible job at transitioning the program this year. And you can really see it in the quality of the agenda. Uh, part of transitioning that program meant adapting our session formats. So you will see many pre-recorded lightning talks and tech demos. You'll see panels and fireside chats. Um, and a lot of strategy sessions and community labs. Um, and I just wanted to make a, a note on the sessions that have caps, which are the strategy sessions and community labs. Um, so there's over you know, 7,800 participants registered to the event. And so there may be sessions at any given time that you don't get into because of that cap. And so we just wanna, you know, make sure that you're pointed in the direction that at any given time there will always be sessions happening that have unlimited capacity so even if you don't get your first choice this program is incredible and we're confident that you will find other other sessions that are engaging and enriching um and you know i think this is a new platform for all of us and um for many of you it might take a moment to get comfortable we are here to support any challenges that come up. Um, feel free to reach out to us. Um, you can navigate to the RightsCon help desk to um, figure out you know, who to reach out to. We have a support line. We also have um, a, a safety line as well. And the last thing on that note that's really important is that RightsCon is a space that is governed by our code of conduct and our privacy and participation policy. And so these policies exist to maintain what is a safe, inclusive, and productive, and positive environment. So you can read them and read about our approach to safety in this online environment and learn how to contact us with any issue that you have in the help section of that platform. Um, I wanted to take one last moment to say a really big thank you to the RightsCon team and the Access Now team and the Tech Change team and everyone who has made this event possible. Um, I think that you know we wouldn't have gotten here without all of them and they've done an incredible amount of work and an incredible amount of work has gone into um, this all coming together. And so I hope you'll join me in thanking them as you come across them over the week. Um, and so with that, I will let you um, I'll soon start. I'm going to pass it over to Melody so she can kick us off for the first ever RightsCon Online. Thank you, Nikki. Um, as we heard, I mean, this session was almost too short and there are so many follow-ups that we would have liked to discuss. The good news is that, I mean, you've seen it, you've seen the program, maybe you're overwhelmed by the program and by the number of sessions that will be going on um, throughout the week. I invite you to really scheme through what you may be familiar with, but also what you may not be familiar with. It's um, an event where we really want to challenge one another and address the issues with a solution-oriented mindset, uh, but not just, and it's really like the, the platform to share information. I know that there are really exciting launch and, and exciting breakthrough happening this week as well, whether it's a new report, the launch of a podcast, and new initiatives uh, being kicked off this week. So yeah, let's dive uh, right into it. Thank you very much again for joining us. And I look forward to seeing and writing to many of you online this week. Thank you.